Lord, me say ever since I made it to the top, I turn their target. Them not for sign me, me pass their budgets. Not be mouth, not be brag, just change the subject. History of Slavery and its Abolition by Esther Copley. 1839. In the reign of the succeeding pharaoh, their hardships were perpetuated and even increased. And the gracious interference of Jehovah to deliver them by the hand of Moses was but a signal for the infliction of new cruelties. More work was laid upon the men, while the means of performing it were denied them, and new severities were exercised in case of failure. The slavery of the Israelites in Egypt appears to have been a more exact counterpart of Negro slavery than any other age or nation has produced. Its aggravated degree of guilt and offensiveness in the sight of God were sufficiently marked in the awful plagues which devastated the land of oppression and at length procured the release of the captives. A historical sketch of slavery from the earliest period by Thomas Cobb, 1858. Chapter two, slavery in Egypt. Next to the Jews, the Egyptians have the earliest authentic history. And as ancient Egypt was not only the cradle of the arts and sciences, but has been justly said to be the first that found out the rules of government and that the art of making life easy and the people happy. Our attention seems to be properly next to the history of her system of slavery. The bondage of the Israelites shows that the Egyptians were not only slaveholders at an early day, but hard taskmasters. That they had slaves not only aggressive, but domestic, attached to the persons of the master, is abundantly shown by the inscriptions upon the numerous monuments of their ancient grandeur. It is moreover well agreed from these monuments that many of these domestic slaves were of pure Negro blood, and one of them, a large number of Negroes, are represented as prisoners of war. Upon one of the monuments at Thebes, an Egyptian scribe is represented as registering Negroes as slaves, both men, women, and children. Upon another, a victorious Egyptian king is represented as putting to flight a troop of Negroes, and still another, they are represented as indulging in their favorite amusement of this day, the dance. These representations are so perfect that the most unpracticed eye would recognize them at glance. The Southern Literary Messenger, a magazine devoted to literature, science, and art. Richmond, July 1860. The Negro Races. The subject of this lecture is the Negro Races. It is not of the institution of domestic slavery as it exists in the Southern states and elsewhere but simply of the Negro races considered ethnologically. I wish by tracing them through the Egyptian monuments and the historic period to fix as nearly as may be their place in the scale of animated beings. Now we have the history of the Negro races for a long time, for at least 3,500 and indeed a certain sense for more than 4,000 years, for there exist unquestionable proofs of their presence in Egypt under the 12th dynasty, extending back to the 23rd century before our era. But the earliest actual portraits of the race which we possess 
relate to the 17th century before Christ. And from this period, therefore, I prefer to date their history. From this period, there is an abundance of monumental evidence bearing upon and illustrating that history. Beginning with the 17th century and extending throughout the whole monumental period, we have innumerable delineations of the Negro and the mural paintings and sculptures of the Egyptian temples and palaces. Complexion, features, expression, these and every other attribute of the race, if modern archaeologists are to be credited, are depicted precisely as we are accustomed to seeing them in our daily walks. Upon this point, I feel I am authorized to say that the proofs are both abundant and conclusive. Detail here would be out of place. The result, as established by the best authority to which the monumental evidence invariably tend, is that the social position of the Negro race in Egypt 3,500 years ago was substantially the same that it is now in the United States. The American slave code in theory and practice, its distinctive features shown by its statues, judicial decisions, and illustrative facts by William Goodell, 1853. The slave is goods and chattels, and these cannot earn wages. The sustenance of a horse and ox are not wages. The needful repairs of the machine are not wages. Were all the slaves as fat and sleek as Henry Clay's, their comfortable fare would not be wages. Besides, the cost of sustenance for the slave were a matter of mutual stipulation is too trivial to be dignified with the name of wages. Look over the preceding chapters. Estimate the labor. Look at its products, houses, equipages, wardrobes, wines, feasts, exports, returns, revenues, banks, cities, navies. Imagine an exodus of the slaves like that of the Hebrews out of Egypt and let the wand of their Moses sweep along with them all the products of their labor. What would be left after them?